hope you'll have a chance to have uh, Venus Manu. Just uh, take that over a little bit of time. But but the truth of the matter is that uh, you know, if Chaim Shmulevitz also had a Venus Manu, what was his Venus Manu? He said he would um, put on slippers instead of shoes in the base medrash. So uh-huh. that was the, to be I'd say the Indian of of, of Venus Manu. Uh, but what I want to talk about today, and I, I hope, again, it might, might be repeating something that someone else gave a share about, but I want to talk about the 15th of Av, uh, which is coming up in Mir Hashem, Thursday night and Friday, is the 15th of Av, and uh, we don't do much to celebrate it, we don't say Tachanan, but that's about it, but the Mishnah in Masechus Tainus tells me, Lo hayu yamim taivim li Yisrael, there were no happy days that were happier than the two happiest days of the year, Yom Kippur and the 15th of Av. The Gemara then says in Tainus, and again, Baruch Hashem, many of you may see him on Tainus, so, uh, so you learned this, that we understand why Yom Kippur is a happy day, which, by the way, that's also important. Some of us don't intuitively think of Yom Kippur as a happy day. You've got to fast, and davening is so long, and you're standing up, and your back is hurting, all of these different issues. The truth is, the Gemara says it's a Dover Pashut, Pashat, that Yom Kippur is a joyous, happy, wonderful day, a day of forgiveness, a day of reconciliation, a day in which all of your Averis go away. What could be happy, happier than that? Uh, my mashkiach, or David Kronglas, the Colonel of Bracha, uh, used to say, he was a European uh, mirror, he used to say for mirror that every second of Yom Kippur to him was as sweet as honey. In fact, that's interesting. I normally we don't darsh in English words, we darsh in Hebrew words. But I think there's a beautiful drasha on the word atonement, day of atonement. If you split it into three words, at one meant you're one with God. At one meant. I don't know if that was intentional in the English word, uh, but that's a very good drasha. I don't know if it's legitimate to give drashas in English words or whatever. By the way, another good English one is commencement for graduation, because commencement in English both means the beginning of something, and it's the seum, graduation, because the pshat is that uh, when you end, you're really having a new beginning. That's another drusha in English. So be it as it may, the Gemara says, Yom Kippur for sure is a happy day. That's pashat. But what is the gewaldige simcha of the 15th of Av? So the Gemara gives no fewer than six reasons, six reasons why Chamisha Sarbiyav was the happiest day of the Jewish year. So I'm going to go, the Gemara does not give them in chronological order, but I'm going to give them in chronological order so it'll be easier to follow. Uh, the first reason, which is actually the most complicated because Big Machlokas Rishenim, I don't understand it. So the Gemara says very little. The Gemara says, Pasku Bo Mese Midbor. The people who would die in the desert as a result of the Chedam Maraglim, where Hashem decreed, because of Tisha B'Av, they were crying, that they would die over a 40-year period. The 15th of Av was the end of the deaths of the Dor Hamidbor, and therefore we celebrate. Well, if it just means the last group died, <laughs> nobody died because nobody was left to die, that, that wouldn't automatically be a simcha. <laughs> and besides, how is that connected to the 15th of Av? So, so the Gemara itself does not really explain it in full. Rashi brings from the Yushalmi a pshat in 15th of Av and Mesu Bob Mesei Midr. It's not in the Babli, it's in the Yushalmi, and Rashi brings the Yushalmi. And this is a very interesting example of how sometimes you can't understand the Babli without the Yushalmi. That's why there's actually a Tachnit, there's a program that somebody started you know, we know Daf Yomi, where you learn one Daf of Bavli and you finish it uh, every seven years. So uh, the person wanted to make a parallel calendar. Uh, the Yushalmi is much shorter than the Bavli, so a, ba- a, a Daf of Yushalmi will only take three years. So basically, in order to stretch it out equally, you would like learn, learn one Omud of Yushalmi with the Daf of the Bavli, and that way you would finish it mm. to match it up, etc. So Rashi brings the following. We know that Hashem was Geyser because of the Chet HaBaraglim, that uh, that generation would die. Now, what do we mean by that generation? Anybody who was 20 years old at the time of the Exodus would die in the midbar. So the only people who didn't die, women didn't die because they had a moon and Hashem. Shevet Levi didn't die 
because Rashi learned Shevet Levi did not commit the sin of the Miraglim, and Yehoshua and Kalev didn't die. They were the good ones. Everybody else, there was a Gezerah that they would die. But the Yushalmi says the following, Chap. Nobody died before the age of 60. So the Gezerah was on anybody who was 20 or older at the time of the Exodus, mm -hmm. would die over a 40-year period. So the Yushalmi says the following, Every Tisha B'Av night for the 40 years, Klal Yisrael would dig a grave graves and they would sleep in their graves that night I'm not sure how well they slept <laughs> anyone who had reached their 60th birthday in the preceding year did not wake up died and anybody who uh, was not yet 60 they had to experience the death experience of sleeping in a, uh, in, the, in, a in a grave but they got up the next morning Okay, that's how it works. The Talmud Yushalmi says nobody died before 60, which means the people who were just 20 at the time of the Exodus, they were scheduled to die in the 40th year of wandering in the desert. Right? Nobody died before the age of 60. Now, on an average, this would mean if you had a population, I'm using approximate numbers, if you had a population of 600,000 people who had to die over a 40-year period, that's approximately 15,000 a year. Now, obviously, we don't mean that to be an exact number because people have different ages, etc. You know, you didn't necessarily have the same age groups uh, every year that had reached 60. But let's work with the average of 15,000 people died on every Tisha B'Av over the 40 years in the desert. So now we're in year 40. Year 40 is the last Tisha B'Av. This is Rashi explaining. This is the last Tisha B'Av in the desert. Right? Year 40. So how many people are left from the old generation? Let's assume 15,000 people. I'm using an average, obviously. So they dig their graves. And they get into their graves. And they expect that they're going to die because they are the last 15,000 of the generation that was 20 years old when they left Mitzrayim. And lo and behold, they wake up the next morning and they're alive. What's going on? So they figured, well, maybe we miscalculated the date. Maybe uh, we dug our graves. It wasn't the ninth of Av, it was the eighth of Av, or the seventh of Av. Maybe we just got mixed up. So they did it again and again and again and again and again and again. And every time they woke up until they saw a full moon which is the night of the 15th of Av. And then they realized, Baruch Hashem, Hashem must have given us an amnesty for the final 15,000. So according to the Yushalmi, when it says that the Meisei Hamidbor stopped dying, it actually means on the 15th of Av, the last 15,000 people realized that Hashem was Mavater, Hashem wow. was Mochel, the Gezeira, for the last group of people, allowing them to enter Eretz Yisrael. So the Vitor did not happen on the 15th of Av. The Vitor happened on the 9th of Av, but they didn't realize it until the 15th of Av. And that's why it became a great day of Simcha. Now the Emma says, this Yushalmi is very, very rare, because the Torah itself says, of the generation of the Dor Hamidbar, the only people who were Zoha to enter, besides the women, which are not mentioned, but the only men that were Zoha to enter was Yehoshua and Kalev. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, Rashi does bring a Chazal that Shevet Levi was able to enter, but that's not a... I see you might ask on Rashi, how could Rashi say Shevet Levi entered? The Torah says the only men were Yehoshua and Kalev. So Shevet Levi is not a problem because what the, when the Torah says no men entered, I mean no men who were counted in the census mm. were able to enter. But Yehoshua and Kalev, Shevet Levi was not counted in that census. But like the Yushalmi, you do have a problem because the Yushalmi is actually telling me 15,000 people who should have died in the last year didn't die. So it's not just Yoshua and Kalev, it's Yoshua and Kalev and 15,000 of their closest friends. So you do have a problem, right? How, how does the Yushalmi fit the Pasuk itself that says only Yoshua and Kalev? So some of Farshim learn, but to me it takes away the joy. Well, yeah, they didn't die Tisha B'Av, but remember, 
we're not going to enter Eretz Yisrael till Nisan, meaning, meaning the Adar after Tisha B'Av will be when Moshe Rabbeinu dies, and we cross the Ardain on the 10th of Nisan. So there's around eight months until we enter Eretz Yisrael. So the 15,000 people who didn't die, they died over the next eight months, so they Taka did not enter Eretz Yisrael. That's a good terrace, but you know, I don't know, that kind of, I think, takes away the Gavald of Gesimcha of the 15th of Av. I think, they didn't die the 15th of Av. Okay, but they all died in the next eight months. You know, okay, I mean, I, I don't know, that would kind of take away the Simcha. But this is uh, one of the Tirusim that they give uh, for the Yushami. Now, the Emes is, once again, the Bavli doesn't say that, and there are, are, there are Rishayim that learn Paskubo may say Midbar in a totally different way. They learn Avada, the last 15,000, did die. And that was the end of the Gezerah because there was nobody left to die. And then, Klal Yisrael sat Shiva collectively for the 40 years of death. And when do you get up from Shiva? If you start Shiva on the 9th of Av, the 15th of Av is getting up from Shiva. So, it's a very different chap. In other words, according to the Yushalmi, Paskubo Mesei Midbar literally means 15,000 people who should have died didn't die. That's the Yushalmi. Uh, Taisus learns another pshat that it just means we were finished with the deaths and we were able to get up from our last shiva. And that was a simcha in the sense that there's a certain nechama that we are finished with the tragedies and the like which means, according to that pshat, everybody died who was supposed to die, right? Now, the Ritvan Bava Basra gives a third pshat, which is very, very fascinating. He said that, but the, the numbers don't work out, and I, I've worked on, on doing charts for this around 40 years, and I, 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 I can't get the chart right, but I'll tell you what the Ritvan says. The Ritvan says that in reality, the Gezeira of the Miraglim was anybody that was 20 Bishas Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim. If you weren't 20 Bishas Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, you didn't die in the Chet of Miraglim. But Klal Yisrael misunderstood the Gezeira. They thought anybody who was 20 at the time of the Miraglim yeah. is Chay of Misa. So the Ritva says, here was the Cheshman. The people who were 20 Bishas Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim they actually died in day 30, in year 39. So the people who were left over were not Chay of Misa at all. They were the people who were 20 at the time of the Miraglim. They thought they were Chay of Misa. But in point of fact, they were not Chay of Misa. So that way, the Taira is good. Anyone that was 20, Bishas Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, did die. But the people who didn't die were the people who thought they were Chay of Misa because they were 20 at the time of the that was a year and a half later. Uh, they didn't die, and uh, they thought they were Chai of Misa, and when they realized they weren't Chai of Misa, that was a great simcha. But this is the Ritva's Chiddush, which is very, very beautiful Chiddush. I cannot figure out the numbers. The Ritva makes the assumption that the last generation who was 20 Bishas Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim died in year 39. That's the Ritva's mm-hmm. Hanacha. Uh, do the chart, do the math, uh, plot out every year. It doesn't work. Uh, the people who were 20 Bishas Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim would only have been 59 in year 39. They wouldn't have been 60. So to, to make the cheshpan that everybody who uh, was 20 Bishas Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim died the year before, I, I can't figure it out. Again, I, I've been making charts on this for 40 years and... Uh, I think the Taisis Yamtev actually does have a Tzarech and I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure about that, but, but uh, the arithmetic is very, very difficult here. But at least the aside of the Ritva is actually very interesting, right? So we have three different Pshatim <coughs> in Paskubo, Mesei, Midbar. We have a, an amnesty. 15,000 people who should have died didn't die. And that's a great Simcha, but the Kasha is that contradicts the Pasuk, that only Yeshua and Kalev. Then we have a second shot that everybody who died, who should have died, did die. And the simcha is simply getting up from Shiva. And the third shot is 
that everybody who died did die by year 39, but there was a certain group who thought they were Chayav Misa because they were 20 by the time of the Miraglim, but in fact they were not Chayav Misa because they were not 20, Bishas Yitzias Mitzrayim, and their simcha was that they discovered that Baruch Hashem, they were not Nichlal in the Gezerah. So these are three explanations for the phrase, Pasku Bo Mesei Midbar. So that's only simcha number one. We got five more to go. Then we have simcha number two, and this gets us back to the B'nai Salafchad. The B'nai Salafchad is actually a play in three acts. Uh, Salafchad was a man from the tribe of Menashe. Uh, He died in the desert. Uh, His daughters make it very clear he did not die because of the spies. He died because of his own sin, Uh, according to Chazal. He was the Machal Shabbos, the one who... (laughs) Uh, carried the wood, but he acted the shame Shemayim to show people that you have to keep Shabbos even outside of Eretz Yisrael. And there was a lawsuit, so to speak, between Salafchad's brothers and Salafchad's daughters. The halacha was known that when a man dies, his property goes to his sons and not his daughters. But what's the halacha if there are no sons? The brothers claim that a daughter can never inherit property, and therefore it's Salafchad has a portion in Eretz Yisrael. He, he's, not, he's not going to arrive there, but he does own a portion of Eretz Yisrael. Who gets Salafchad's portion? The brothers say it goes to us, and the daughters say it goes to us. Moshe didn't know the halacha. Moshe asks the Rebani Shalaylam, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if there are no sons, the Yerusha goes to the daughters. So round one, goes to Benos Salafchad. <laughs> they established the precedent that a boss inherits property when there are no sons. But then the brothers had another type. They had a good lawyer. They said, well, wait a second here. These are single girls. They are inheriting property that belongs to the tribe of Menashe. And remember, although half of Menashe was east of the Jordan, but the other half was in Eretz Israel proper. What's going to be if these girls marry a man from another tribe? They marry Yisachar or Zebulun? So then what's going to happen is the property will go to the husband, and when they die, it'll go to their children, and their children will be of the tribe of Yisachar or Zebulun. So what's happening is Menashe is going to get cheated out of its territory because it may go to another tribe. Now, somebody asked me, Akasha, well, what are they worried about? I mean, everything's going to even out, will it not? Because if you're telling me single women from Menashe will marry outside of the tribe, taking Menashe's land and bringing it into another tribe, so single women from other tribes will marry Menashe boys, taking land and adding it to Menashe. So isn't it all going to even out? But there are two answers to that. First of all, there is no uh, indicator at all that the numbers would be equal. You can't tell ahead of time. I mean, if, for example, Menashe loses, whatever it is, Menashe loses 100 acres because the girls marry out, you can't automatically assume that single girls from other tribes will bring in 100 acres, right? You you don't have the same numbers of people necessarily. That's one reason why this is not an answer. And another reason why it's not an answer is that there's a certain benefit to continuity of territory, meaning to say, the Torah envisions, and indeed this was the case in the time of Yoshua, that each Shevet has a designated territory. Now, if you're going to allow single women to marry outside of the tribe, that means within every tribe there are going to be enclaves that belong to other tribes. So I don't have the continuity of my territory. Okay, so yes, if Menashe gives up 100 acres to Yehuda, and they get 100 acres in Yehuda, that's not the same thing, because I've lost my 100 acres in my tribal chalet, and I have 100 acres, you know, 300 miles away. That's not the same thing. So their time is, we don't want to dilute. This was their second argument. Once again, Maishu Rabbeinu asked Hashem, and Hashem proclaimed a very, very interesting halacha. And that is, if an unmarried woman inherits property from her father, because there are no sons, she is only allowed to marry men from the same tribe as her father. To ensure 
that the inheritance remains within the tribe. Mm -hmm. In other words, the daughters of Tzalavcha have to marry people from the tribe of Menashe. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now, interestingly enough, it was understood by the oral law, by the oral Torah, that this was a temporary law. This was not meant to be a permanent law. And this was to guarantee that at the time of the original division of Eretz Yisrael, the tribal units would be intact. We don't want there to be a dilution before the Chalukah. Now, it took 14 years for Eretz Yisrael to be conquered and divided among the different tribes. 14 years, meaning Yoshua, 14 years of Yoshua. Once the Chalukah Sa'aretz was completed, then any daughter that inherits property could marry any person that she wanted. Because the Chalukah was done properly, and then what happens later is what happens later. According to our tradition, although there's no textual proof, the day that Yehoshua bin Nun abrogated the Halakha and permitted women who inherit property to marry outside their tribe was the 15th of Av. Mm. And therefore the 15th of Av was a simcha because it was the day that women could marry any Jew that they wanted, anyone. They were not limited. Now we know the Mishnah describes that in the time of the Bayez Sheni, Tubiav, 15th of Av, was a day of marriage. Uh, women would uh, assemble, they would dance, uh, I, I often think sometimes that uh, the, the Yiddishkeit of Chazal seems to be almost a different religion in some ways. I mean, imagine, you know, people talk about, a, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'll say, okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> that, that we talk, we, you know, we talk about a Shidduch crisis, right? We have a Shidduch crisis. Yes. So let's assume you have a Shadchan that says, I have an idea for the Shidduch crisis. Let's get all the women who are unmarried and have them come to Gan Saker and uh, they will dance around, yes. and the men will 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 assemble, and the men will. Uh, of course, the women will. All, the women will all wear the same clothes, borrowed clothes, because we don't want there to be discrimination based on fashions and the like. Okay, but later, and the women will dance around, and the men will choose the wives that they want, and this will solve the shidduch crisis. We'll bring all the girls together and all the boys together, and there'll be a church. Well, I can tell you this: if some shots can come up with this idea. Number one, he would be blacklisted from every yeshiva <laughs> uh, in Eretz Yisrael, for sure. He would be condemned as not be kairis or a kaifer, whatever it would be. Uh, because, what are you talking about? What type of behavior? What type of preachers? <laughs> and yet, and yet, and yet, this is what the 15th of Av was. It was the great marriage day. Now, in truth, it is very much the case that we are actually stricter in many of these uh, Sineas aspects than was the case in the time of Chazal, and there actually is a good reason for it. Mm. That is, as, a, as the generations get more and more decadent and more and more immoral, we sometimes have to bend over backwards and move in the opposite direction so we don't get sucked in. At a time when there was more Sineas in the world and people were acting with Shem Shemayim, so you could be a little makel on some things because they, they, they would not lead to bad consequences or preachers and the like, right? So there is such an union of something the Shem Shamayim, which uh, even if it looks funny to us, wouldn't automatically be so treif. But in Zamanim of preachers, sometimes we have to bend over backwards. But you understand now, based on this second reason, you understand why Tubiyat became a marriage day because that was the day. Mm -hmm that Yoshua ben Nun matired women to marry from every tribe. Now, there is a second, I'm going chronologically, let's go to the third reason of Tubiav, which is a second marriage-related reason, and this propels us much, much, much later in the Tekufa of the Shaiftim, the period of the judges. Now, the period of the judges, which lasted for more than 300 years until we had a king, uh, was a very, very difficult period. Uh, there was a lot of lawlessness. Uh, people were not, in, in different generations, people were not keeping mitzvahs. In fact, in the book of Shoftim, there's a refrain that's repeated over and over again. By Yomim Ahim, in those days, Ein Melech be Israel, there was no king in Israel. Ish kala yashor be'ein yasa, 
Every person did what he wants. Now, you might think that sounds good. In the book of Shoftim, it's very, very clearly a very, very negative statement. Hefkeris, lawlessness. And one of the most tragic stories in the book of Shoftim is the story of Pilegesh Begiva. Pilegesh Begiva means a concubine in Giva. Giva was simply a town in Binyaminite territory. And it's a whole Misa about a levy that was traveling through uh, and he needed lodging in Binyamin and he had his Pilegesh with him. Uh, and uh, you can see, I mean, the truth is every single person in this story comes out looking bad. And the, the levy gets lodging in somebody's house and he has his Pilegesh sleep outside. Nice. I, mean, that, I mean, even that already is like, what's, what's the shot? Okay, so she's sleeping outside. Uh, what happened that night essentially is she was gang raped and uh, died. She was not murdered intentionally, but all of the abuse, she literally died. And in the morning, you can see how desperate it was. I mean, the Pusik is very graphic. It describes her lying dead on the uh, threshold of the house with her hand reaching towards the door trying to get in. That was her last attempt to try to escape. She died. He gets up in the morning because he has to travel home and he sees her lying. He thinks he's, she's alive and he kind of uh, kicks her says, oh, lazy, you know, lazy person, get up, gotta go. That's his only reaction. He says, get up. She doesn't get up. So what does he do? Again, everybody is bad here. Uh, he takes her body. He cuts it up into 12 pieces. What? He mails it, I don't know, Federal Express, UPS. He sends it to the 12 Shvatim of Klal Yisrael. And he says, look at what the tribe of Binyamin did causing her death. And he demanded wow. that the Shvatim take action against Binyamin. And the Shvatim had a meeting, a convocation, and they demanded what we would call in modern terms extradition. They demanded that Binyamin extradite the offenders so they could be tried by the basin of Klau Yisrael, so to speak. Binyamin refused. Now the Ramban says, this is a very interesting political argument. It's very reminiscent, if you know American history, it's very reminiscent of the causes of the American Civil War. Shevet Binyamin argued that every Shevet is a separate nation. There's not one Jewish nation. We are 12 countries which have a common religion, the Torah. But we are a separate nation. And we have the right to judge and punish people who do Averos in our land. But you don't have the right. right? Just like Israel could not demand that somebody who murdered in the United States be, be sent to Israel, the other way around. So therefore, essentially, Shevet Binyamin argued that we are not it's an interesting argument. We are a, a religion, but we are not a nation, meaning we're not a single nation. We are 12 nations, which is mamish, if you know American history. The Civil War was fought over that very issue. It was not fought over slavery. It was fought over secession. Does a state have the right to kind of leave the, leave the nation or not consider itself part of the nation? So what happened was, Lahabdil, just like the American Civil War, Klal Yisrael declared a war against Binyamin tragic. You know, Jew against Jew. And now obviously Binyamin is greatly outnumbered, and yet they fought ferociously. Yaakov Avinu called Binyamin Ze'ev, like a, a wolf of prey, Ze'ev Yitrev. And thousands of people were killed on both sides. But at the end of the day, Shevet Binyamin was almost decimated, almost totally eradicated. And for the few survivors who were left, uh, the nation, the Shvatim, took a Shvua that no man will give his daughter to a Binyaminite to marry. And that would have meant eventually that Shevet Binyamin would have become extinct. extinct. Cosmically and spiritually, that would have a tragic repercussion because the Shlemus of Klal Yisrael would no longer exist in the world if a whole Shevet would be extinct. So the Maskana Sadvaram was that Pinchas, who was still alive, and he was the Kohen Gadol, he martyred the Shvua. He found a ground to annul the Shvua. 
And as a result, Shevet Binyamin was mutar, lavo bekal. And once again, our tradition was that that was the 15th of Av. So we have two oh. marriage issues. One is, in the time of Yeshua bin Nun, uh, women who inherited property could marry into any Shevet they wanted. And the second marriage one is by Pilegesh Begiva, Shevet Binyamin was mutar lavo bekal. By the way, very, very interesting little thing. Uh, when the book of Shoftim gives you a list of the survivors of Binyamin, very small numbers, it gives you two numbers. One number is a little larger than the other by a few hundred. And Targum Yenison says that's because the difference in numbers were the smaller number are the Binyaminites who remained in Eretz Israel, but the difference was a few hundred escaped and found their way to Europe, which is quite amazing. So according to Targum Yenison, some Jews of Shevet Binyamin entered the European continent even before the first Beis Mikdash was built, not before the Korban, before it was built in the period of the Shevetim. It mentions Germany, France. Now, it is interesting, I believe, although I haven't been able to confirm this yet, that the royal family of England mm. claims some type of descent from the tribe of Binyamin. Not Yehuda. Our monarchy is Yehuda. Binyamin were not monarchs, but Epis, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and they have some yichus to Shevet Binyamin. And there's something in the coronation ceremony. I have to look at the nusach of the actual coronation, <laughs> in which they make some reference to Benjamin and, and a connection to Benjamin. And people might think, oh, well, well what, that's a Baba Maisa, like, what, what's what Shaykh is. But the truth is, based on the Targum Yenison, it could even be possible that people from Shevet Binyamin reached even the British Isles. I mean, once, you know, once they got to France and Germany, crossed the English Channel, and, you know, you're there, right? So um, it's very, very intriguing. I'm going to try to see if I, if I could get some more documentation. But I remember hearing that there, there were some Shaykhs between Shevet Binyamin and the British royal family, yeah. When, when uh, the rest of the tribes wanted the offenders to, to be uh, judged by the faith, so yeah. the, the faith being of Kali, so yeah. was, I mean, surely Binyamin, Shir Binyamin had representatives on that faith name, and also is this the first time that that, they, that, that there was opposition to, to going, like, like, was this faith name of Kali, so... Well, presumably, the basin of Klai Israel, I'm assuming, would have, been, would have meant the Sanhedrin of 71. That, that, that would be the supreme basin. Now, in truth, uh, why is Shevet Binyamin wrong? It's not at all clear. I mean, they have the right to, the, you know, uh, not every Dine Nefashos case goes up to the Sanhedrin of 71. But I think the idea was that Shevet Binyamin was not prosecuting, so to speak, meaning they were just letting these guys go. And that's why the Shvatim were so outraged, because each color Yosher of Boys will be boys, whatever it is. You know, mm-hmm. don't make a, don't make a big deal. So this was such a novella. Uh, in fact, it, there's even a lashon that says there was not a novella like this from the days that we left Mitzrayim. That's how it was described. It was such a horrendous, such an horrendous thing. Okay, so I mentioned what I mentioned three reasons for the fifteenth of Av. One is Paskubo may say midbar. The other is uh, a daughter that inherits property could marry other tribes. Uh, the third uh, is Shevet Binyamin was mutter lover because so that reason also connects to marriage. It's a marriage day and the like. Now let's go to the fourth one. The fourth reason already takes us to the time of the ten tribes. We know that originally under Shaul HaMelech, under David HaMelech, we had a unified Jewish nation. But what happened, Shlom, right, but what happened after Shlomo died in the reign of his son Rechavam there was a rebellion. Ten tribes rebelled against Malchus based of it. And for the next 200 years, we have two kingdoms. We have the northern kingdom, whose capital was Shomron, and they were ruled by kings of the tribe of Ephraim from Yosef. And that goes by the name Malchus Yisrael. And then Malchus based of it only had Yerushalayim and a little bit around Yerushalayim, and they only had basically two tribes, Yehuda, Binyamin, and they did have Kohanim and Levim because they worked around the base on Mikdash. Tremendous thing. So the Malchai based of it had a very small Malchus, Malchus Yehuda, 
and the ten tribes had a much larger Malchus, Malchus Yisrael. The first king of Malcha Yisrael was Yeravam ben Nevat. Yeravam ben Nevat was actually started off at Sadik. He was at Sadik, and in fact, he was anointed to be Malcha Yisrael by Achia Hashilaini, who was a Navi Mamish. But eventually, Yeravam ben Nevat became contaminated by Gaiva, by power. And he became the epitome of a Russia. In fact, when the Rambam gives an example of Bechira, he says, everybody can be as big a tzaddik as Meisher Rabbeinu. And when the Rambam is thinking about the opposite, <laughs> as big a Russia as Yerevan ben Nevat. Because Yerevan ben Nevat was not only a sinner, but he was Machdi as Rabbin. He caused others to sin. And so the specific thing that he did, he did many things, but one of the specific things was, he didn't like the idea that Yidden from his kingdom were still going to Yerushalayim to be Ayla Regal and bring Korbanas to the Beis HaMikdash. So he put guards on the roads so that, like the Berlin Wall, that nobody could leave the kingdom to go to Yerushalayim. So that way he shut off access to the Mikdash. And he built golden calves, Egle Zahav, that should be worshipped instead of Hashem. He brought back the Ego, cut off the base of Mikdash, brought back the Ego. And for 200 years, Yidin could not go, the 10 tribes could not go to the base of Mikdash, and uh, they were worshiping the Ego Hazav. Jeez. The last king of Malcha Yisrael was a man called Hoshea ben Elah. And Hoshea ben Elah decided remove the guards, remove the wall, tear down the Berlin Wall. Anybody who wants to go to the base of Mikdash, mm. let him go. That's Kavaldik, Simcha. And our tradition is he did that on the 15th of Av. We regained the ability to go to the base of Mikdash. But there's a big question here. Well, wait a second here. I said he was the last king. What happened? That is when Assyria Sancheirev. This is more than a hundred years before the Churban Beis Hamikdash destroyed the Northern Kingdom and dispersed the ten tribes. And to this day, we talk about the lost ten tribes. The whole discussion: Where did the ten tribes wind up? Some say they were the American Indians, <laughs> and some say they're the Pashtuns of Afghanistan, and some say uh, part of them are the Ethiopian Jews. China, India, some say Vikings. All sorts of uncertainty. In fact, maybe I shouldn't do this. I'm going to tell you a funny anti-Semitic joke, but it is funny, even though it's anti-Semitic. In, in the 19th... <laughs> forgive me. Uh, in the 19th century, there were some British, Anglican people who were very much into finding the Lost Ten Tribes. They thought somehow if they find the Lost Ten Tribes, uh, they'll bring Yashka back into the world, whatever their husband was. So they approach a prominent uh, lord in England, and they say, would you give some money so we could find the lost ten tribes? So the guy says, certainly not. I'll give you money if you can lose the other two tribes. (laughs) He says, I don't have to find the ten tribes. Let's lose the two tribes. But okay. But be it as it may, the Gemara, ah, forgive forgive me. Anyway, but it says, it says, like, um, if Hoshea ben Ela did such a gavaldiga thing, why would the Malchus be destroyed right after that? Here's what the Gemara said. Because he took away the guards, and he took away the walls, and he said, anybody who wants to go can go. And nobody went. Bishlama, all the other years, even though Hashem knows the truth, people have an excuse. I couldn't go. What do you want from me? But now you have the opportunity and you don't go. Now it's a chayt. It's reminiscent, you know, Baruch Hashem today, it is actually much easier to learn for a person with limited background than it ever was in Jewish history. You know, 50 years ago, a person might say, I never had a chance to go to yeshiva. I don't know Hebrew. I don't you know, live near a shoal with a lot of shiorim. What does God want me to do? What am I supposed to do? Today, we have, you know, Art Scroll and and many other translations and internet shiurim and online classes. So on one hand, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
that the Torah is so much more accessible than it ever was. But you also understand that that creates a tremendous responsibility because when Hashem gives you the options to serve Him, then you lose the excuses that you had when you didn't have the options. It's mamish like Hamisha Zerbiyav. On one hand, it's Gavaldic. He removed the guards. Everybody could go to the Mikdash. On the other hand, if they didn't go, that makes it much worse. So it's something to think about that in a generation where Hashem in his chesed has given us much more choices and opportunities than we previously had, there's a much stronger achrayas to utilize the options that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. And maybe precisely because we are a weaker generation, Hashem made it easier to learn than was formerly the case. Okay, so that is, I'm losing count, that's the fourth one, right? Okay, fifth one. We now go all the way to the Chorban Bayes Sheni, not the Rishon. The first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. But the second was destroyed 490 years later on the same day, 9th of August, 490 years day to day by the Romans. And the secular year that's commonly given is the year 70. According to Chazal, it might have been 69, 69, 70, whatever, whatever it would be. But you know, that wasn't the end of things. Around 60 years later, the Jewish people started a great revolt to overthrow the Romans under the leadership of a man whose name was Shimon ben Kuzba, but Rabbi Akiva renamed him Bar Kochba. Mm -hmm. Bar Kochba means the son of a star, and Kochav is a term we use for Mashiach, and Rabbi Akiva actually believed Bar Kochba was Mashiach. Maybe another time we'll talk about this. Was Rabbi Akiva wrong? How could Rabbi Akiva be wrong? Was he wrong? Could Bar Kochba have been Mashiach? had the generation merited. And Bar Kokhba initially was very, very successful. He liberated from Roman rule over 900 villages. I mean, some of them were small, but Imamish captured a lot of territory. He minted coins. You can actually buy Bar Kokhba coins. They're not that expensive. You know, like $50, you can get a Bar Kokhba coin from, from, that, uh, from that time. And there's even uh, archaeological evidence on the Harabayas that uh, under Rabbi Akiva's guidance, they began to build a third base of Mikdash. Oh. They, they thought Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, Mamish thought, Bar Kochba was Mashiach and they could build a base of Mikdash. But eventually, what happened was Hadrian, Adrianus Caesar, Hadrian, retaliated with overwhelming force. He was pulling Roman armies from Europe out of the British Islands. He like sent the equivalent of a nuclear bomb. Uh, everything that he had, he crushed it mercilessly. And this was the Bar Kochba uh, the, the, uh, in 135, was the fall, the massacre of the Bar Kochba revolt. And that occurred in Beitar, which is not the same as modern Beitar, but not too far from it. It's around a mile away. It's an arche archaeological uh, dig. And the casualties of Khorban Beitar are much, much greater than even the casualties of the Khorban Beis Amikdash itself. The Gemara gives numbers that are astronomical. If you looked at, the, at the, uh, the numbers in the Gemara, you have tens of millions. Again, the Maral, others say the numbers as exact numbers are guzmas, meaning uh, there, there weren't tens of millions of Jews in Eretz Israel. But still, Chazal are emphasizing the point that these were astronomical losses. And not only were the numbers of Yidin who were massacred on the 9th of Av in Beitar, the year 135, right? The Chorban is year 70, this is year 135, 65 years later. Not only were they massacres, much, much greater, but all of the, when we read about the Romans made gezeras, that you're not allowed to learn Torah, you're not allowed to do bris milah, all of these gezeras, this was not after the Chorban. The Romans destroyed the temple as a political statement so the Jews would stop fighting against them. But even after the Chorban, there were no gezeros against a Yiddishkeit. You could keep Shabbos, you can keep kosher, you could wear tefillin, you don't have a base of Mikdash. I mean, obviously, that's, that's awful. But there was no gezeira against the practice of the Jewish religion. After the Bar Kochba revolt, that's when all of the gezeiras happened. That's why Rabbi Akiva was tortured to death for teaching Taira. That was after the Bar Kochba revolt. Jews were not allowed to live in Jerusalem. 
for 200 years after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Jerusalem was turned into a temple to Jupiter called Ilia Capitolina. And only once a year, Yidin were allowed to circle the city on Tisha B'Av to mourn the, the destruction of the temple. And to this day, there is an old minag among Yerushalmis uh, to walk around the city walls on Tisha B'Av because that was a minute that went all the way, all the way back. So, that was the Chorban of Beitar, the Chorban of Beitar. But not only that, but Hadrian did not allow the corpses to be buried. He wanted to humiliate the Jews, he wanted them to be uh, devastated, and he fully expected, obviously, corpses would decompose and stink, and they would see their father and their mother and their children rotting on the ground, and that would destroy them. But lo and behold, a miracle happened. But the bodies did not decompose. And Hadrian kept this up for three years and a week. Meaning finally after three years he realized that he really wasn't accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish with this. So on the 15th of Av, that's three years and a week after the destruction of Betar, he allowed the corpses to be buried, and therefore the 15th of Av was the day of Haruge Betar Nitnu Likevura. Now, Chazal made a liturgical change in Birkas Hamazon as a result of this event. The original Birkas Hamazon had three brachos. The first bracha, thanking Hashem for food, was composed by Meisher Rabbeinu when the man came down. The second bracha, thanking Hashem for Eretz Yisrael, Allah Oretz ve'ala Mazon, was written by Yoshua ben Nun when they entered Eretz Yisrael. The third bracha, asking Hashem to have mercy on Malchus, Beis David, and Yerushalayim, was written partly by David and partly by Shlomo, and that ended with Uvnei Yerushalayim, Baruchat Hashem, Bonei, Barachma, Yerushalayim, Amen. And the reason why it says Amen is because that was the end of benching. So Amen signifies the end of something. That was it. After Haruge Beitar, Chazal added the fourth blessing of Birkas Hamazen, which is, goes by Hatov native. God does good, God is good, and God does good. Hatov, He is good, that the bodies didn't decompose. And He does good that the bodies were buried. Yeah. Now, talk about trying to see the good of Hashem <laughs> in the most difficult circumstances. One would not associate this as a simcha. Hundreds of thousands died. Hundreds of thousands were mavuzah that they weren't given a kavura. The gezeros against the Torah were still in effect. But you see the Hashkafa of Chazal, that in the darkest moments of life, you try to see hope, you try to see something good, you squeeze out the goodness of Hashem, even from the greatest and deepest tragedies of life. That in Harugei Beitar, Chazal say, look at the chesed of Hashem that the bodies didn't decompose, which of course is actually a supernatural miracle and look at the kindness of Hashem that we could bury our dead. It's really a lesson in our Kara Satov, even in the most difficult aspects of life. Look for what is good. Look for what is kind. Even if it's really, really deep beneath the surface. Okay, uh, that's five, right? So yeah. the sixth reason uh, was this. You know, one of the things that the Beis HaMikdash needed on a very, very constant basis it needed a wood supply. Wood was the fuel of Korbanos. Because of all of the enemies that have attacked Eretz Yisrael over the years, even when we had a base of there were wars that were fought, trees were often burnt down. There were shortages of wood. And therefore, whenever we had enough wood for the Korbanos, that was a special happy occasion. Now, the halacha is that for the wood of Korbanos, you want to have very dry wood, because if wood has water in it, it produces smoke. So as a result, the wood cutting season was only in the summer when it was dried out. And the 15th of Av was the last day for wood cutting. 
because after the 15th of Av, the days get a little shorter, and therefore the heat is less intense. Now, the truth of the matter is, I haven't noticed that, but I think, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to get into that. Uh, I, I don't know about climate change, global warming in a global sense, but I, I can absolutely tell you, Yerushalayim is hotter in the summer than it used to be. Now, maybe, maybe there are a lot of reasons. It used to be, I remember 30, 30, 40 years ago, you had to wear a sweater on a summer night. It was chilly, and you have to wear a sweater. Uh, that's been a very long time since that's been the case. You certainly don't have to wear a sweater. I still see old signs sometimes when people uh, are giving a share outside, uh, and they I tell my wife this, and they say, uh, please bring a sweater. I think they're probably recycling a sign from 30 years ago and using the same list of, because wearing a sweater in a summer night is you know, totally unnecessary today. So I don't see that it gets cooler after the 15th of Av, halvai, halvai, but in the time of Chazal, they say it got cooler because the nights, the sun was not as intense, and therefore, you have to complete your wood cutting before the 15th, or on the 15th of Av or earlier, because otherwise the wood would have more moisture in it. So the 15th of Av became a very happy day because that was the day in which Baruch Hashem, we have enough wood for the coming year. Yeah. And therefore, Hashem has given us what we need. Right, so these are the different reasons. Now, there's one other idea that Gemara brings out, and it says, you know, the days get a little shorter and the nights get a little longer. It's still more sun, it's still more daylight than night, but the nights are a little longer. Ah, so that's a simcha. Because now you have more time to learn because if you're a working person, you work in the fields, you have to work the whole day, you can only learn at night. But after the 15th of Av, you have more time to learn. How much more time? Like a minute, you know, 30 seconds? <laughs> you don't get that much more time. And yet, every second of learning is so beautiful and so wonderful. If Baruch Hashem, there's 30 more seconds I can learn today. That's a reason to celebrate. Now, I had mentioned in the very beginning of my remarks that the 15th of Av is the seventh day from Tisha B'av, mm-hmm. counting Tisha B'av. And it symbolically represents getting up from Shiva. Now, getting up from Shiva is an expression, but it actually has a halakhic resonance. When, God forbid, a person sits Shiva, mm-hmm. on the seventh day, they actually are supposed to get up and they're supposed to leave the house. There's an old minog that the Avel physically leaves his house and walks around the block. You take a walk. Because that signifies the idea of rejoining life. That Hashem does not want us to be in perpetual mourning. Hashem gave us a life. He gave us obligations. He gave us responsibilities. He gave us potential. And therefore, the Avelis of Tisha B'av has to be balanced with the Simchas of getting up. And I had mentioned on Tisha B'av that that's why the Kina of Eli Tzion Viareha, we say standing up, because even on Tisha B'av, by Chatzais, we're getting up from Avelis to some degree, although we're still in Sheva, but we're getting up a little bit. But at the same time, when you get up, you don't forget the Beis HaMikdash. You still think about it but it no longer paralyzes you. It's in your mind and it's in your heart that you then go on and live the life that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you. I remember a hearing that was very, very moving uh, of uh, Yosher Ber Salavechik, Zechon Lebracha. There was a year in the 70s in which he lost his brother, his mother, and then his wife. Mamish one year. And although he was able to teach for a number of years after that, those who knew him well, I did not know him well, say he never really recovered. He was never the same after this awesome string of tragedies, especially the loss of his wife, to whom he was very, very close and attached. Uh, and at the end of his third shiva, he said, uh, a, a vort, and it's coming from a very deep place, that Chazal say, Hashem made many worlds before this one that he destroyed. Why did Hashem make worlds that he would destroy? Why didn't he just make the right world? So he says, everything Hashem does is to teach us. Hashem wanted to teach us that even if your whole world gets destroyed, you go on and you rebuild. Because what did Hashem do after the worlds were destroyed? 
he created again. A person can't be miyayish, can't give up. This is what Yidin did after the Holocaust. <coughs> this is what Yidin did after the Chorban Beis Hamikdash. Right? You don't give up. You understand that Hashem gave us an achrayas to try to create, create families, create Torah, create mitzvahs, to try to rebuild that which we lost. So you never forget the Beis Hamikdash, but you also have to get up as well. And the 15th of Av represents that idea of getting up from Shiva. So Be'ezrus Hashem, I hope it should be uh, a day of simcha for us. And uh, Be'ezrus Hashem, we hope Bechlal, that the 9th of Av that we just experienced should be the last uh, Tisha B'Av of, of Avelis and Chorban. And it should become the day that Mashiach is born and a day of Geula for Chal Yisrael. Amen. Amen.